Okay, let's flash back to the beginning of competitive Pokemon in the base set era, that's base through fossil, and kind of look how people were playing in the very early days. Like I've covered on the channel before, there wasn't a lot of information sharing going on. The internet was not very useful for finding Pokemon information, so it was really just word of mouth and mostly magazines. And one thing that magazines always tended to cover on the competitive side of things was the Haymaker deck. And Haymaker was a huge part of competitive play. If you look at official tournament data, Haymaker and Rain Dance were basically topping the charts. And they intermixed a little bit of Wigglytuff, a little bit of Chansey here and there. But before the popularity really exploded and information was shared, Haymaker looked a lot different. Before magazines started reporting on the best decks that they had seen at tournament or through playtesting, all people had to go by when deck building was starter decks and how those were constructed, the suggested deck lists that were officially published in Nintendo magazines, or decks that they saw in the Game Boy Color game. But one thing that all of these decks had in common is that most of them ran at least 20 Pokemon in them and were a little on the scarcer side when it came to trainers, especially compared to what we ended up seeing as the final product for Base Fossil. When the idea of Haymaker was first being thrown around and you saw these early versions, it included Hitmonchan, Farfetch'd, Ponyta, Machop, Electabuzz, and Doduo. Of course, when Jungle released and Scyther was being thrown into every single deck, it replaced most of those Pokemon, and people started realizing that with a good enough trainer base, you didn't need to have that many Pokemon and so this is when Haymaker really slimmed down to that classic trio that you always see, which is Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, and Scyther. With Fossil came a new Haymaker card in Magmar, but people typically used it interchangeably with Electabuzz, so most Haymaker builds either had Magmar or Electabuzz. You rarely saw them together. So now we have Haymaker with about 12 Pokemon, running playsets of Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, and Scyther. This was a really consistent, slim, smooth, easy to use deck, and its success really helped solidify the notion that you don't have to fill a third of your deck full of Pokemon, you can actually run off of very few basics. After this gameplay for Basic Era became much faster, and you had a lot of mirror matches between Haymaker builds, these matches were essentially decided by who had the better trainer build and who could attack first, or at least who could avoid knockouts better than the other person. This is essentially the split we saw in the deck building community where half the people said we're going with these consistent bulkier versions of Haymaker that are really going to help avoid knockouts and that's how we're going to win games. And then on the other side you had these people say well we're just going to make Haymaker even faster that way we can start getting damage off earlier and that's going to win us games. This is where we get to the point of this video which is me explaining what insanity was. So if you go on the old Pojo forums from like 99 and 2000, you'll see a lot of people just saying, yeah, I'm running the basic insanity build plus, you know, whatever. And when I first saw this, I had no idea what it was. So I really had to take a deep dive into these articles and really do a web search, figure out what insanity was. And it's basically this side of the Haymaker split where people were saying, we got to go faster. You know, at this point, Haymaker had been shaved down to about 10 Pokemon, uh, because if you go any less, you have to do a lot of mulligans, and that gives your opponent an advantage. And in the base set era, where speed was your entire game, you didn't want to give your opponent too many extra cards. But Insanity basically said, screw that, we're going to use eight basics. Basically, the entire reason it's called Insanity is because people playtested this and then came back and said, dude, I just playtested the most insane build. Uh, but to dive really further into this, you really have to look at this article by Lura Lee, and I'll link it down in the description, but just to give you a taste of what it is, and I honestly can't tell if they're being ironic or satirical, but to start the article, they have a warning label, which is the reading of this deck can warp your mind into a couple of useless hemispheres. Don't think too hard while reading this deck and its strategy if you do, or if anybody present with you while reading this deck have any sort of heart condition, including heart murmurs, please be careful while reading. Side effects may include, and then they include a bunch of side effects. And this is throughout this really long article explaining what insanity is and why this dude loves it and how he's a progenitor of it. 
it, it's honestly kind of an insane article. So according to this article, the very first version of Insanity was posted on Pokegym in November of 1999. And here's the deck list. I'll throw it up. So you got four Magmar, four Scyther, and a bunch of trainers, you know, and then way too much energy. You got um, 17 energy there. And so this isn't a great build, um, but I think... You know, it was important in people realizing that you can just run eight Pokemon and you're not going to mulligan as much as you think. This really got people started thinking about uh, draw percentages, which is a really important part of any competitive card game. And that's the, kind of the current mental state of thinking, well, I have four copies of this in my deck. I've already drawn one. There's a chance it may be in prizes. So what are the chances of me drawing it if I play a Bill or a Professor Oak? And really going through that mental tedium the entire game. So it was really more about competitive thinking instead of just regular deck building. This was the start of some forward thinking for competitive Pokemon. And got a lot of people talking. They started to think more mathematically uh, about this insanity deck. And so what they did is they tried to create a formula on how to create the most efficient or fastest version of a Haymaker deck in which they created some terms that I will go over now. First one was versatility that was represented by V, which is the chance of wanting to play a card. So if you had a bill in your hand and you wanted to play it 70% of the time that you saw it in your hand, you, you would have a V value of 0.7. And that's a complete nonsense number because in base set era, most of the time if you got a trainer in your hand, you went ahead and played it, especially with last running around and there's not a lot of cards you would have much incentive to hold on to unless it's like a plus power or a defender. The next is resource trade factor, which was really how many resources the card would let you obtain or take away from your opponent. So an energy removal would have an RTF score of one because it was discarding one energy away from your opponent's side of the field, while something like Professor Oak would have a value of seven because you're getting seven cards from it. Lastly, and most importantly, especially for base set era, is card cost. And this is basically the net gain or loss you're getting from playing trainer cards. And this is pretty important for base set era, so I don't know why people weren't thinking more thoroughly about this concept yet. They may have been, um, but according to this article, this was a relatively new way of looking at it. So, if you play Professor Oak, in most scenarios, you're going to probably discard Professor Oak and maybe one other card you have in your hand but you're going to be gaining seven. So you really have a net gain of five for Professor Oak. And then when you look at cards like Super Energy Removal, you're discarding Super Energy Removal plus another card from your hand, but you're also discarding two cards from your opponent. And so it's almost like there's a net gain or loss of zero. So the final equation was what they called their gameplay advantage for each card. So you would take your resource trade factor, multiply it by the versatility, and then subtract the card cost. And this was supposed to give you a value representing how essential that card was to your deck. Way of thinking seems really complicated and really stupid because you would think through playtesting, you would just figure out which cards work better anyway. But this is a really important part of the Pokemon TCG especially carrying on when things got more advanced when you started factoring in regular trainers and supporter cards and then when you got into uh, stuff like the Holland block where you had Holland Transceiver which became a staple for every deck that was a trainer that just pulled a supporter out of your deck and so really how do you factor in the cost of that but at the same time you know I really am appreciative of these early people that are going wait hold on you know there is a kind of science to this and I still do this while deck building, whether it's implicit or not. Cost benefit analyses actually become really important for figuring out what it is that your deck's trying to do and how it's going to play best against every other deck that you could possibly expect. And so let's move on. Let's go back to insanity and look at the final kind of build that came out of all of this insanity workshopping, which was not bad. You got four Magmar, four Electabuzz, we got some beautiful play sets, uh, just a couple copies of Gust of Wind, a couple of Item Finders, very efficient deck, and then uh, six Lightning Energy, six Fire Energy, which I, I think is perfect um, when you only have eight Pokemon that are generally going to be attacking with only one energy. 
And I actually built this deck and play tested against regular Haymaker a bunch, and it actually does perform better. Uh, they were right. Getting it down to just eight Pokemon, you don't have to mulligan as much as you would really think. A maximum of four times, you're going to end up with a basic. But this was a deck that was running 40 trainers, and that can be a real problem, especially when you're playing other decks like Rain Dance that run last. And last does completely destroy this deck. And so they drafted a final version of this that was supposed to be kind of last proof. And to do that, really all you have to do is add two copies of last yourself. And so this is the final playlist. A lot of people were kind of interchanging Magmar and Hitmonchan because Electabuzz did have that weakness to Hitmonchan. Magmar had a weakness to Rain Dance, so it was really situational depending on what deck you were playing the most. But on the whole, this deck was fast enough to really deal with all of the heavy hitters from the base set era. Important discussion that came out of this insanity project, as Lurley calls it in the article, because he goes on and adapts insanity for almost every Pokemon set that comes out, like all the way up through Neo. But um, that discussion was that you couldn't just hand this deck to a new, inexperienced Pokemon player and they would win. This was a very technical deck and you really had to know what you were doing and really understand the game in order to do these cost-benefit analyses in your brain and figure out, you know, this is how I'm going to get this card to do this. While my, while your opponent's playing their turn, you're, you've already figured out what you're doing for the rest of the game based on what you got in your opening hand. And that's a very important concept in Pokemon that a lot of people don't really understand. You can't just net deck and buy all the cards for a deck and then go to a tournament and expect to win because you're playing with people that have more experience, that are more into the rhythm of the gameplay. Than, and when you build your own deck, when you go into a game knowing exactly how many copies of each card you have, knowing exactly the chances of drawing each card every turn, you, and really getting a handle on top decking. Top decking has really saved me and screwed me in a lot of games. So as ridiculous as that article is, and again, I really suggest you, you take a look at it with the link down in the description and really see how people were talking about the game back then. It can be a little cringy at times, but again, you see these important concepts coming up that really permeate across all TCGs and especially Pokemon, even up to today, where they really place an emphasis on deck expertise, knowing exactly what's in your deck and how it plays. Because you do experience this kind of flow when you're playing a deck that you built and that you've been playtesting for weeks or months to where it kind of reacts to situations in its own unique ways. And you can change out even one card in that deck and it'll play differently to you. And this is something people were kind of just discovering for Pokemon, apparently, at this point. I assume that at the same time, uh, Magic players had already figured out kind of these concepts and they were first starting to carry over. And of course, I do have to mention that theory crafting for deck building is a pretty big part of this channel. A lot of request decks that I throw up or even kind of uh, the just for fun decks are just me taking individual cards and saying, how do I utilize this card and make it the best it possibly can be within the restrictions of a format. And that's incredibly fun to do. Uh, it's a great cognitive process and actually completing that deck is very satisfying. But this is something that, yes, it seems like it kind of started there in 1999 at the very end of that base set era after Fossil and continued and evolved and developed all throughout the Pokemon TCG to where Theory crafting now is at an all-time high, especially with set previews coming months before release. People already have deck lists built. People are already playtesting using proxies before, you know, like three sets away from when those cards even come out. And players can go a little crazy with the theory crafting and the playtesting. And if, you know, if you've sat in a game shop while it's very busy and everybody's playing and discussing the current metagame and net decks, that people can get uh, pretty intense about this kind of thing. And so I think maybe Insanity is a great name for, for where this began in the Pokemon community. And if you go back and look at those Pojo forums from 1999, you really see people were really excited about this deck. Everybody was talking about it. The problem was uh, everyone was posting these deck lists just saying like, yeah, I'm running Insanity, but with one ditto in it. 
and so you know it did take some digging to actually figure out where this insanity thing really began so i did hope you enjoyed hearing about this tiny little milestone in the history of the pokemon tcg and competitive play i thought this was a really interesting just little nugget that i happened upon and then started to dig around to see what people were involved and how this deck actually performed as far as official tournament placings insanity doesn't really have any although if you look at the top placings for uh, just base set base jungle and then base fossil even in the base rocket you'll see that all the top decks are haymakers and that as time goes on they do have less pokemon in them most of the top haymaker decks in the tournament listings from back then do have about 10 to 12 pokemon so they didn't go full insanity i think that in the end consistency did win out because you do see a lot of haymakers that'll run your uh, classic trio but then they'll have maybe one copy of a Tauros or one copy of a Ditto or they'll run Dodrio which of course is just for maintaining your setup and for avoiding knockouts so in the end Insanity didn't blow up as much as they expected or maybe how uh, the article writer literally made it sound but it did have an impact on the overall community as an end note here, I do want to give a huge shout out to Cody Brian Searley, who did this piece of fan art. It's the very first piece of Drunk Shuckle fan art. If you like this style of artwork and you want to see more trainer and Pokemon poses and even some cool snapshots from Pokemon Snap, then check out Cody on Instagram. I'll put that link down in the description as well. Look forward to more decks and vintage Pokemon content in the future. Just stay tuned to the channel and until next time, bye.